Uh, welcome back to the first episode of 2019 of Sip the Tally Podcast. And I'm here with a young lady that um, has a, a great rise to her current position. I'm not going to necessarily go into detail about it. I'll let her uh, tell you about it when we get into the questioning part. But if you had a chance to listen to my uh, intro podcast, I referenced a young lady that was a major inspiration to me. She covers the entire state of high school sports with a little help. I don't want to read about Again, I'll let her say it in her own words. But um, again, welcome, Courtney Cronin. Hey, thank you for having me. That was, that was quite an introduction. I uh, bring me back there with all my uh, high school sports days in Mississippi. That's that's really kind. Yeah, I, re- I really appreciate what you did for all the kids there, and it was it was great entertainment and and, and good to see you busting your butt doing the job you did, and I think it paid off. Yeah, no, I had a great time. I mean, it's I was having this conversation with someone earlier today just about um, what the last six years of my life have have looked like, and you know, such a such a big part of who. I am today and where I came from was my Mississippi roots. I mean, I'm Mm -hmm. from Chicago. That's, that's home, but I feel like I still claim Mississippi, uh, as, as a part of my home, just because I spent three of, you know, more of my formative years of my life there, uh, Mm -hmm. getting to learn the state, getting to, you know, fall in love with, you know, people, places, things, kind of the whole thing that made up my job down there. And it was so much more than a job. It was, you know, very much a lifestyle. Um, and you know, in high school sports and recruiting, that whole realm was part of it. And I would never trade where I am today. Um, I would never trade my experience in Mississippi because it would not have gotten me to where I am today if I didn't have that. Uh, you're a native Chicagoan, right? That's right. And that's that's, right. that's a great sports town. What was it growing like in, in Chicago with such a uh, deep sports uh, tradition there? It was, I mean, when I grew up, because I'm a 90s kid, so mm-hmm. obviously the Bulls teams, like the first three I don't really remember because I was so young, mm-hmm. uh, the first three championships, but four, five, and six were kind of my formative years of becoming a sports fan. Um, and, you know, when Michael came back and, and, you know, just it lit the city on fire. I mean, basketball was a huge part of my childhood. Childhood growing up, but so was baseball. I mean, mm-hmm. nine, I always tell people 1998 was one of my favorite years, um, even though it's only eight years old, because I just remember every summer uh, begging my parents to let my brother and I stay up late so we could watch the home run race between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. And oh you know, it's God. obviously the, the steroids era, but I mean, that was my formative years of becoming a sports fan and, you know, getting to, to learn about sports and, and watching baseball through the eyes of my brother. And, you know, that really. You know, we didn't have a lot of good football teams in Chicago when I was growing up. I mean, the Bears went to the Super Bowl my junior year of college Mm -hmm. or excuse me, my junior year of high school. But, um, you know, baseball and and basketball were where it's at. And, you know, Chicago is a great sports town. The Hawks came on, you know, they won their three Stanley Cups when I was in college. The the Bears, obviously, you know, I'm not a Bears fan anymore. I don't really know if I ever was because they just really they were so bad when I was growing (laughs) up. But um, I know it was a wild time there for for a minute. Uh, this season with the Bears going 12 and four. I know that it's a great sports city when your teams are doing well. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, that uh, home run race, that that gave me my love. Like I had just finished playing baseball, but I think that rejuvenated baseball for the for the country because everybody was in oh, yeah. the home run race. Everybody was tuning in to see if McGuire would hit one or Sosa would come back. Man, that, that was an awesome time to be a baseball fan at the time. Oh, yeah. I, gotta, I mean, that was a fun, I got a friend that was of mine that time. I got a friend of mine, a couple of friends of mine that live in the Chicago area. And for them, what's the best pizza in Chicago? Okay, so like I've got I've got my favorites. Like I like Lou Malnati's deep dish. I think that's really good. Um, what's a few other Giordano's is across the country now, so you can really get that anywhere. Mm-hmm. I would say one of the more underrated ones. Like people always talk about Pizzeria Uno and and you know, you can get it at the grocery store, you can get it shipped to you. Pizzeria Due is kind of like kitty corner from where Uno is down on, I think it's on Ohio Street, right right in River North. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my favorite pizza. That's what I grew up on. Uh, whenever we'd come back from the South Side, like we used to go out and see my grandmother. She lived out in Beverly. Mm-hmm. So like we'd always stop back through the city on the way up, back up to the suburbs and we'd stop at Pizzeria Due. And that is like, you know, m- the hustle my dad used to pull mm-hmm. would be you call in, say, hey, we're calling for picking it up. So, so it gets ready because this place gets packed and then you get there and say hey we're actually going to eat it here and the way it used to work is since the p- hell the pizza was ready they want to let you sit down and eat it you kind of 
kind of gets a bunch of people online. So that's a hustle for anybody who wants to try that. <laughs> um, I don't know now in 2019 if, if, they, if they haven't caught on to that by now, but I think that's the one of one of the more underrated pizza deep dish in, in, in Chicago. But if you're looking for good thin crust, mm-hmm. um, Barnaby's pizza. It's got kind of like a cornmeal on the back. It's excellent. I, I, I really like that. And Pequod's is also uh, good for deep dish. It's a, it's more in the suburbs, but they've got a few, I think like Chicago, Chicago land, not downtown, but Chicago land area mm-hmm. locations. Okay. Uh, now correct me if I'm wrong. Did you intern for the NCA? I did. I worked there as an intern from 2012. So right after I graduated from college Mm -hmm. um, until May or no, April 2013, because that's when I moved down to the SIP. And um, I was there like kind of during I was in digital communications. So it was a paid internship post college. um, And there were like 27 of us total. So there were people working in enforcement, people working in a whole ton of uh, different departments, academic membership affairs, the eligibility center, uh, really like, you know, what the well oiled machine that that makes up college athletics. So I was in digital communications. And really there during a polarizing time, um, I think for college athletics, just when, you know, the Penn state verdict for the four year mm-hmm. bowl ban initially came down when I was there, mm-hmm. um, the Miami Nevin Shapiro case, uh, oh that God. all, th- that all popped off when I was there. I'm trying to think what else. I mean, the Shabazz, the Shabazz Muhammad thing at UCLA, I want to say mm-hmm. like Ed, Ed O'Bannon. What, what about that? Ed, that was uh, just starting. The O'Bannon okay. stuff was like mm-hmm. in the works and that obviously with the ruling and player likeness and all that stuff didn't come out until like what, 2014. So that's the last, mm-hmm. that's the last video game. that right, they had. I, I have the last one. <laughs> yeah. 2K. I mean, it wasn't, it's NCAA 2K football, right? 2K14. Uh, uh, college football, whatever, 14. I'm like 13. Yeah. Or- and they there's there's that that was a great game. And now, obviously, they can't um, do anything with it. I mean, you can manually go in and like put players numbers and things like that, like, you know, go back and try to like make it a relevant game now. But yeah, no, I mean, it was a very eye opening experience. I got to work a little bit with Mark Emmert on a few projects and kind mm-hmm. of get to see up close how the executive branch of the of college athletics worked uh, just from very much a fly on the wall perspective. But I, you know, coming out of college, I figured, OK, I was broadcast major i'm going to be on tv i'm going to be start out the local news route and you know i applied for a lot of jobs and just never never got any of them so i decided you know okay i'm going to fall back on this internship that i applied for when i was still in school found out while i was covering the ncaa tournament in portland uh because indiana was there in in march of 2012 found out i got the internship and was like okay why not we'll just do the internship um and see where it goes and I loved it. I mean, I was there for 10 months. Uh, I got the call about the job in Mississippi and literally never stepped foot anywhere south of Tennessee. <laughs> so um, I had cousins in Birmingham, but I mean, Birmingham's kind of a northern city by southern stretches. So right. um, I'd only been there like once or twice. And I don't even count Florida as part of the south. Like that Florida's its own world. So I've never really been. That's where I've I'm never at really. Now. I hear you. I, it's never really been, you know, I never really been to the South. So I'm like, you know, if you're going to go, you might as well go to the Southest of the, the south. south. So I, the deep South. So <laughs> I decided to pack up my belongings and, and go down to Mississippi. And I got there right at the end of April in 2013. Okay. Um, what, what was your, 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 your um, thing with Malik? How did that come about your, your documentary? Man. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond the game. Mm -hmm. That was, that was a lot of fun. That is probably to this day, one of my favorite projects um, I've ever worked on and how that came about was in the middle of football season in 2013. So I want to say it's like middle of October. Um, My boss approached me and like, was like, Hey, like, there's, you know, not sure if you're aware, but um, they're the number one basketball player in the class of 2015 is right in our backyard here in Jackson. And I, you know, I follow basketball recruiting pretty closely because I, I, I covered it so much in Indiana for 247 Sports that. I, uh, you know, I always kind of knew the names, but, you know, really wasn't into like the recruiting cycle that much at that point. Cause I was doing so much with, with football and, you know, it was, uh, well before the early signing period had taken place, but obviously the kids who were decided like, you know, they wanted to sign, 
Um, you know, early on, I think I remember one of my first commitments was when Breland Speaks committed to Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. And um, that would have been like September or October of 2013. And obviously he couldn't sign until until March. But I just remember I really got involved with recruiting. So when my boss approached me about like, hey, why don't you dig in and see if there's something here with Malik? And I'm kind of like, are you kidding me? At this time, I'm thinking like, you want me to do like balance <laughs> this? You want it? Like he wanted hoop dreams is what <laughs> is what Zach Craiglow, my boss, wanted. And I'm like. You know, Hoop Dreams is one of my favorite documentaries. Don't get me wrong, but that is a like, I don't, I think that's the thing that like newspapers, especially people at the Clarion Ledger, people I worked with, didn't really realize was how much work actually goes into it. You have newspaper people dictating how video is shot and how video <laughs> is edited and how video is produced, and you have one person on staff who can do all of it. So there was definitely a push and a pull of figuring out what the right method was, but it was the <laughs> right idea because Malik was right there. Um, his father, Horatio. Webster was fantastic throughout the entire process. And mm -hmm. we decided, okay, like we're in the middle of football country yet, you know, here's the number one player in the country in basketball that no one's really talking about, like on the big stage yet. So mm -hmm. it was a perfect opportunity to give Malik a platform where he could show off who he is, who he, who he was back then as a high school basketball player, because I think the thing you're going to have to remember is Callaway at that time, his high school was on, they were suspended. They couldn't travel. They couldn't go out of state because that fight they got in in the five, a championship the year before. Mm -hmm. So it kind of hurt Malik as a recruit because, you know, sure. People are going to know you from like the AAU, like in all the grassroots stuff that you do in the summer, but you're not on TV during, right. during the year, you're not able to travel to, you know, uh, Marshall County High School in Kentucky or, you know, the Dick Sporting Goods things or, you know, other things that were available to Callaway at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think it was kind of a way to, like, bring all these people to Mississippi via a video series. I think it was a 10-part doc, seven or seven to ten part for the first one. I think it was longer for the second se season that we did. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a really cool way for us to introduce the world to what it's like for, a, 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 you know, this time – He's, I met him when he was 16 years old. Like that was a chance for us to kind of show, okay, this is the process of what this is actually like from a day-to-day -day perspective. Right. We weren't just there filming, you know, okay, when they win the state championship, when he, you know, when he signs, you know, his, his letter of, uh, letter of intent to go somewhere, we were there for, for haircuts in the kitchen on a Tuesday <laughs> right. and, you know, um, taco dinners, uh, and, you know, stuff like that at the house and just, you know, Malik going up to Durant and kind of just showing where he came from. I mean, that was, it was a very personal project. It became mm -hmm. one by the end because you get to really learn about somebody when you dedicate that much time to hundreds of hours and, and hundreds of gigabytes of footage uh, right. that, you know, made this thing what it was. Now, who, who uh, were you in charge of like editing and cutting all that down and whatnot? Yeah, it was a one man, show, one woman show. It was me. <laughs> I mean, it we it definitely had some eyes help me be like, OK, do you like this? Like, what do you think about this? But the the, the product of, of Beyond the Game itself was all me. And that's not an arrogant way of saying, but it literally was like, I was the one shooting, producing, mm -hmm. editing, voicing over staying at the Clarion ledger till five in the morning, drinking six cans of diet Red Bull all at once to, <laughs> to get this thing going. And I don't think a project of that magnitude, if I had to do it all over again, I would love to have a team, but we mm -hmm. just didn't have that. That just wasn't a thing. We weren't a TV station. Um, and even if you are a TV station, you don't have the, the real estate mo most times in terms mm -hmm. of like, you, you're not putting the whole episode on TV. I mean, right. that stuff is, um, we kind of revolutionized it at that point because you didn't see, you didn't see many people have that back then. What you see mm -hmm. now though is, you know, all these, all these, um, McDonald's all Americans and, and you know, it, it happens in football too. Everybody's got a camera crew. Everybody's mm -hmm. got that uncle or that cousin who's got uh, you know, a DSLR that follows them around and is shooting stuff. They have no clue what the hell they're shooting, but they're still shooting right. nonetheless, like in trying to put stuff together. I mean, what they, what they basically churn out are mixtapes or hype tapes. <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine. Like, do you, but like to do a full fledged documentary style, journalistic, like mm -hmm. approach to this, um, was an exhaust, you know, a career, a career exhaust. Like, I mean, it was, it was the most intense thing I think I've ever worked on just from the amount of time and all the other things I was doing at the time too. Mm -hmm. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it, the ups, the downs, but like you, you, it's someone's life. You're, you right. literally are given, that's why I don't think it would work 
at any other level than the high school level, because you're given the keys for three years to someone's life mm-hmm. um, in, in the trust that you're going to tell their story the right way mm-hmm. um, through, through proper editing and, and, you know, putting in the moments that they don't necessarily want in there, the moments that they don't like. I mean, and with Malik, he wasn't really a kid that you ever had to worry about like, Oh, we might have a scene where we see him drinking or we might have a scene where we see him, you know, like cutting up like with kids like and get in a fight like he just mm-hmm. didn't do that i mean malik was that that term about him being the machine is very true i mean that's he, he that was his life you know mm-hmm. he didn't have a whole ton of friends outside of basketball at the time i mean he was you know and he he, he didn't have any activities outside of basketball his ticket out of jackson and he had a great life like that's the thing this isn't hoop dreams this is not mm-hmm. a kid that was struggling to make ends meet or you know having to take three buses to get over to callaway high school this is a kid right. who you know had a father in the picture which you know we know that in in, mm-hmm. in a lot of in a black in a lot of black communities especially in mississippi that's not the case sure horatio, is. horatio is one of the most I, i'll even go to the point where he's like oh maybe like too involved sometimes and you know <laughs> he knows i got love for him but like mm-hmm. he he was there every step of the way whatever malik needed dad was going to give it was going to be there to help him get it and if he didn't if he didn't have it himself he was going to find a way for malik to get what he needed and that's why i think you know, just kind of showing, um, you know, showing the other side of it like that, that to me is an underrated part of the Mm storyline where it's not a single parent and, you know, trying to get his kid or his or her child like out of, you know, a bad situation. Like Malik grew up in a really nice home, like with a really nice, in a nice community. I mean, Jackson's rough, but Mm -hmm. like, I mean, Horatio made sure that there was no funny business going on. Malik never was allowed to even think of being in street life. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that, you know, their teammates, to Callaway, who who certainly did not have that same privilege and luxury and fell to the wayside, but he had the right people around him that helped keep him on the straight and narrow. And that to me is an inspiring story when we see so many stories of kids falling off and, and just, you know, being a product of their circumstance um, where Malik wasn't that he stayed on the straight and narrow. And I think he really did become a role model in Jackson at mm-hmm. that time. I don't think necessarily Jackson, probably the entire state. I oh, know yeah. my, myself Everybody included. Knew who he was. Yeah. Everybody knew who he was. Myself included. Couldn't wait to uh, each, you know, each week or however biweekly it came out. I was tuned in, locked in, and I was wondering then: Were you doing it alone, or did you mm-hmm. have help? And, yeah, you know, I mean the, the out, whole thing. Back in, it was mostly you. I was even more impressed with what was going on. Now, outside of um, Malik's um, documentary, what would you say your 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 most fun or most exciting thing? most exciting thing done in Mississippi was? Man, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, beyond the game was such a huge part of what I did. Um, and I mean, that, that'll go with me wherever. I mean, that just, that just, that's a piece of my career. That's vastly important to me. That's a part of your life. Yeah. I mean, I spent like a lot of time at that house and a lot of time at Callaway. Like, I mean, now, now I hear that JPS, you can barely step your foot in the door without like getting like wanded. And, you know, you have to like sign 40 pieces of your life away to get in there. But no, I mean, I, I could have established residency at Callaway. I was there so much. Um, I probably would say, you know, I did a lot of really cool projects with our dandy dozen kids and, you know, from, from, from football to baseball to basketball. Um, I really enjoyed, really enjoyed our football coverage. I felt Mm -hmm. like, you know, the biggest thing for me when I was the high school sports editor, when I took over, um, you know, more than just recruiting, and I know it's been different because they don't have as many resources down there allocated at the Clarion Ledger. Like I barely know anybody who even works there anymore because it, the, it's changed. Like, it's the changed, entire, yeah. entire format, the papers changed. Um, you know, the, the a lot of the, a lot of the veteran voices there, the Jerry Mitchells, Billy Watkins, they're they all are no longer there. I believe that there was a bunch of either layoffs or buyouts offered, like that. A lot of people are not there anymore. Mm-hmm. But my my Mississippi, when I lived there, I wanted to kind of follow. I mean, I followed in the footsteps really of Rod Walker because mm-hmm. he he had been there forever, and and even Rod still, Rod's now down in New Orleans, and people mm-hmm. still think he's like. People ask me all the time, Rod, is Rod at the Clarion Ledger? I'm like, no, he's at the Advocate. <laughs> like, <laughs> wrong. Thing. Favor, but um, you know, I saw Rod's approach to it, and just literally going out of your way to know every single coach. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to make sure that when I was there, that my legacy that I left was that it wasn't just the Clarion Ledger 
comma a metro area newspaper we were we were the paper of record in the state like what exactly. you know kids in the pine belt were just as important to me as what's going on up in south panola mm-hmm. as to what's going on down in you know hattiesburg down in the jackson metro down to you know what's up in the delta or like mm-hmm. even I mean, some of my best stories came from things i did down on the coast and um uh, that was important to me. And a lot of that started with football because, mm-hmm. you know, we cover the state championship. We cover every single game, 1A through 6A, and same thing with the MAIS group. Um, but you, you don't get to, like, get the best stories by, you know, not ever going down to Bay St. Louis and, and going to check on the Rockashaws. You don't get mm-hmm. the best stories by not going up to, you know, Ashland and, and seeing what 1A basketball and 1A mm-hmm. football looks like. I mean, that to me was such a cultural experience. Um, and that really fed into my mentality of what I wanted to do with the paper, at least with my section, because um, I think that at least there, because I was only there for one year that they did the big banquet um mm-hmm. the, it was the year we had drew Brees actually Brees, which yes. is really really cool like now looking back on that especially after the season that he had um but i just remember seeing so many faces that were not just brandon pearl clinton mm-hmm. madison like it wasn't just the metro area i remember seeing kids who came hours away from you know People coming in from the night from Senatobia, people coming up basically from Memphis. Our Olive Branch girls came all the way down, um, mm-hmm. and I think they might have even stayed overnight. Like that team, like the dynasty uh, with uh, Maya Taylor and that whole group. Mm-hmm. Like, I just remember like that meant something to those kids. And that was kind of like me being able to look back on my work and be like, OK, this is why you do it, because you're bringing an entire state together. Mm-hmm. I don't know you if you can do that in any other state, because I just I think Mississippi is a rural enough state to where the ties to people like if you live down in Gulfport, you know, somebody you got cousins um over in Etta, Mississippi, mm-hmm. over by Starkville. You got cousins <laughs> up in, let me try to think another, let me go real far north. Um, you probably, you know, Ashland's around. You got, you got, Corinth you got or something. Yeah. Um, Chillicothe. You ever been Chillicothe? Mm-hmm. It's a tiny I little town next to, next to Walnut. Um, <laughs> Have you I been have to been, it? I have been to it. I have been to hot coffee. I've been all all the names <laughs> uh, that you can imagine, um, you know, in there. But it's just like that to me was, you know, I felt like, like I, I don't even I tell people this all the time. Like I'm from Illinois, but mm-hmm. I'm from Chicago. Like I don't know anything south of I-80. I've never been to Springfield. I've never been to Peoria. I've never I've been to the University of Champ. I've been to University of Illinois Champaign to cover basketball games. Like mm-hmm. when I was in Indiana, never went, never went like from being in Illinois, I had no reason to, but like, I don't know anything in my home state. Like that's why I kind of claim Mississippi as closely as I do, mm-hmm. because I could drive all over that place in, in some of the sketchiest rural areas you'd imagine. And I never felt unsafe. I always mm-hmm. felt I'd find something, I'd find a good story. I'd, I'd find welcoming people um, because everybody there seems to have have some tie to somebody else. And yep. I don't think you can find that in a lot of other states. Maybe it's, maybe you could find it in Louisiana or you could find it in Alabama, but Mississippi's kind of got that charm, in my opinion, that it's a small town that just so happens to be a state. Exactly. If that makes sense. Now, the, the good thing about, what well, the good and bad thing about our state is mostly, you know, we're pretty much last in all economic situations. But, mm-hmm. and, you know, we have the, the old school racial undertones. But when, oh, you sure. throw, when you put a ball in front of a bunch of people in Mississippi, all this stuff go away for yeah. two hours, three hours. And if they, and everybody loves their team, despite who, who their team is, whether it be uh, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Southern Miss, or any of the high school schools, they love sports. Well, I'm not they. We love sports there. And that, you know, that kind of supersedes everything. Because uh, in Miss, like here in Tallahassee, you go to a, a football game on Friday nights, you may have, you know, a uh, 100, 200 people there. But when you go to a game in Mississippi, the entire town is there. Oh, sure. By, Absolutely. By the, the town could almost be shut down because of everybody's going to the game on that Friday. That's the thing I enjoyed about it that much. Like where, you know, I actually, when I moved down there before, before, like I signed my papers to go, I was like, okay, I'm moving to Mississippi. Like before I got, you know, down there, I was like, I'm going to watch Friday night lights. Cause I'm like, Texas isn't that far away from Mississippi. <laughs> let's, let's see if this Friday night lights thing. I, I like, I just went through the whole six seasons or whatever it was in like, 
three months. So mm-hmm. I finished it up when I got down there, but it really is. Um, a, there's such a parallel that you can draw from the show to like real life Friday Night Lights in Mississippi. And that's why um, when I look at it, it's just, you know, you see like yeah, the, the police escorts. I remember driving mm-hmm. up, 50, driving up 55, like trying to go to uh uh, Brandon at Madison and you see like in the left lane, like you see like a police escort. It got three buses, Brad Peterson's pulling his crew from Brandon. This is like this a long time ago, like pulling his crew from Brandon all the way up to Madison to go mm-hmm. face off against Bobby Hall. And they've oh. got a police escort for high school kids. And I'm like, yep. Oh my, like that's real life. And that's, you know, the tailgate. My, my 14 and, and, years. That's every Friday. My, yeah. my, my, every Friday. And and I love that because that it means something at that level. Because when I was growing up in Chicago, like I grew up in Glenview, which is about 10 or 11 miles north of Chicago, like downtown Chicago, but like Chicago proper is not very far. So like if you live in the Chicago metro area, that's considered it. Um, high school football. I mean, my team was, they were, they have a lot, they have a bigger class section that we were eight, we were eight, uh, uh, class eight. I mean, it was a big school. I had, 3,000 kids in my high school, something like that. Wow. And, um, but I actually remember Friday Night Lights. Like, I was, uh, I worked on my school's uh, radio broadcast team. So, like, I was doing play by play of games, but it was so different back then. Like, and it's so different in Illinois where you don't have that community feel, in my opinion, that you get with the South because, you know, and, and there's a lot of reasons for it. I've tried to figure them out as I've gotten older and, and lived in different places where, you know, in California, unless you're at like De La Salle or, um, you know, some of the other big name powerhouse programs, like you don't get that on Friday mm-hmm. night. Like it's, right. it's that community aspect because, you know, that's one of the biggest things in town that's, you know, brings the parents together, it brings mm-hmm. kids together, it brings businesses together. And yep. it, it's honestly such a unique experience to Mississippi that I don't think in, in, in Alabama, probably too, in Louisiana, but I just don't think that you can replicate that anywhere other than the southeast portion of the United States. True, true, true. Now, um, I just want to tell you how the paper changed from that those two to three years you were there. It okay. was going from like everybody had this subscription where you know you got a paper on your your front step when you wake up or whatnot. But you were in the part of that transition to digital. Where yes. People kind of stopped buying papers and was looking online. And the series you did um, was it with Tauti, John Tauti? Yeah, those recruiting rewinds. That was our yeah, first thing I, that we worked on together. I love those. Uh, I, also, the fact that you covered from, like you said, Olive Branch all the way down to Gulfport. I actually met you physically, uh, instead of as, not through Twitter. You came to Columbus for, I think, to check in on Colin, maybe, or yeah, uh, something like that. Right. And, and that's when we met. And I saw you over there. I'm like, it looked like Courtney, and it was you. And you know, we talked for a minute and whatnot. And that was the, the first time I got to like physically meet you, and it have been impressed with your work since then. But um, let's kind of transition out of the state of Mississippi, which is, and I think the the work that you did there is in, is a direct correlation to where you are now. But let's bounce. What what? How did you move from Mississippi to your next venture? As I watch them on TV right now. Yeah, the, are you watching the dubs right now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Man, they that was such a wild time because I got out there in March of 2016. So they're in the middle of trying to chase the Bulls record, the 73 and 9. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, really in turn sacrificing Stephen Curry's health for, for the postseason when he when he, you know, hurt his MCL uh in Houston in the first in the first round and mm-hmm. you know never really was the same. I mean, that was such a volatile time that postseason where you've got Drake. Draymond getting suspended for doing dumb stuff like <laughs> with Steven Adams and then LeBron. And um, it was, uh, you know, it's definitely an, a very much reverse culture shock because I go from such a small place to a massive place where it's like, OK, you're from Chicago. You should be used to this. But living in the Bay Area, I mean, that's, you know. That's six million people in a 42 mile radius. I mean, it was Mm. absurd. Um, But I really enjoyed my job out there because it kind of brought me back to what I was doing when I first got to the Clarion Ledger, which was building a video platform, building, um, you know, a newspaper, having a video presence. And the harder thing, though, was because I wasn't dealing with, you know, high school athletes and the access and recruiting and things like that. There's some college sprinkled in there where you could shoot your own video, which is, you know, Cal and Stanford. But, you know, 
you know, we were, we were dealing with like TV rights and like how to get through it and how to get by with like the NBA and the NFL, NHL, MLB. So it, it really challenged my creativity to show things in a different way out there and create content that would still be visually compelling by, you know, really not focusing as much on the games itself and finding like bigger stories that we could get involved with. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was very lucky. I had a really, I had a really good colleague out there, Marcus Thompson, who works for the athletic. He really took me under his wing when I first got there. Um, and I mean, Marcus is one of the most connected humans, uh, you know, <laughs> I've ever met. He's a fantastic journalist. Um, and he took me on the, this ride through East Oakland um, with Harrison Barnes, who I believe mm-hmm. now is with the Magic, or no, he's with the uh, Mavs. Mavs. Dallas. Mm-hmm. And um, we, it was the first like big video project that I shot. It was like within three weeks of being there. And he did such a tremendous job of opening me up to this world to see like, okay, so I've been, you know, I was trying to search for that community feel that I felt in Mississippi. And you can kind of get lost in the fray when you're in such a big state like California, especially a place like the Bay area. But that's why, you know, Oakland to me is kind of like my version of living in, you know, Jackson, living in mm-hmm. Fondra and living in, you know, the metro area and, and really kind of how like when I think of my time in California, Oakland's what comes to mind because I covered the Raiders mm-hmm. really heavily that year. They went to the playoffs in 16. Um, and I did so much with the Warriors from like the first year where they lost, uh, you know, they went seven games and blew a three, one lead to the year mm-hmm. where, you know, a few weeks later they signed Kevin Durant and then they're back at it. And then they went in five. So, and then I was out of there. Like, that's the crazy part. Like I was, <laughs> I was out of there real quick at 17 months, which that's not even two years. So you got you got the tail end of the seventy two win season, and you got yes. the, the you got the full um, season for the, the championship, which will be their second championship, I think. Yes, that was her second title. Okay. So I kind of got I got to see the best of both worlds, and mm-hmm. it was that was covering the NBA at that time. I mean, was when it was like really really peaking in popularity, and I mean now it's obviously with the ESPN deal uh, where it's on TV every single night. Mm-hmm. It's such a huge sport. Will it ever surpass the NFL? I'm not really sure. I don't think so. I don't think but so. Like the NBA is is definitely um, you know, and, and just kind of the, the way the conference is structured and who's good and who's not. I mean, it's still very top heavy, but I think they're real. There are some teams trying to even it out. I'll give them that. Yeah, it's extremely top heavy, but I love and I'm, I'm a Miami Heat fan. But right now, I only team I pay to see is the Dubs. Yeah, I hear you. That's crazy. I hear you. Because, it, I mean, if you go see them, you're basically getting an all-star game. Especially Absolutely. With Boogie start now. Oh, I can't wait for that. Yeah. So um, now play went to Florida, Kelly Village, started in the great state of Mississippi, which is. It's probably one of the most ruralist places in the United States. Then you go to the Bay Area, which is probably one of the most populated areas next to your, your major, major cities like L.A. and New York. So how did the job you have now, how did that come about? It's kind of a funny story. I um, was going to go to The Athletic, like before the big athletic boom, before they had, um, you know, they had a few different spots before it became pretty much in every city. It was in Chicago, Cleveland and Toronto. And The Athletic Bay Area was starting um, out in San Francisco. And it was going to be myself, Marcus Thompson, Tim Kawakami and Anthony Slater, basically our, our four warriors people. We were all going to kind of go over together and start, get this thing off the ground. Um, I was going to go as a managing editor, which would have been more of just kind of a functional role, like making the whole thing, making the operation work. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it would have been hard to be a writer there still, but it also would have been an incredible opportunity to really tap into the different side of the business. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was finishing up a shoot on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, right before training camp started. It was a 49er shoot. We were in, um, I think in Saratoga, California. And, I remember I got an email from now my current executive boss being like, Hey, not sure what's going on with you right now, but like we have an opening for um, uh, someone to come join our NFL nation team to cover the Minnesota Vikings. Would love to talk to you. Uh, Give us a call. So to make a long story short, it was kind of like if ESPN reaches out to you, you have to answer. Like you right. absolutely have to answer. <laughs> and it, because I was ready to go. I like, you know, had like a, you know, I was ready to sign my papers to go to the athletic, but I was like, you know what? I would hate myself if I didn't take this opportunity. It's time to put yourself first and go for it. So, mm-hmm. um, 
within a couple days, like I was out there over the, the coming weekend and I, you know, turned 27 on August 1st, 2017. And that morning I woke up to an offer in my, uh, on my voicemail from the talent office, which is based in Chicago. So, wow. uh, it was re- really cool. I mean, it was, it was such a whirlwind of an experience to move. Okay. Like, hey, it's like you accept, all right, now you got to start prepping for the Vikings. Well, what, what's going on in Viking land? Okay. Sam Bradford and, and, you know, all this stuff. And then it's okay. You got to pack all your stuff up and literally move it 2,500 miles across the country and, you know, start a new life in a place that you've, I've never been to Minnesota before that. So, I mean, it was, it was such a surreal experience, but I knew I had to kind of stop and enjoy it in the middle of it and be like, you're going to go work at ESPN. You are going to be covering the sport that you really, really like. Cause at that point I kind of realized, okay, the NFL's what's up. Like that's, it's, it's a moneymaker. People yeah. are interested in it. There are 32 teams and you know, it's the biggest thing. It's the biggest thing in town every week. And, yeah. you know, even when it's not, and there's it no, there's no bigger off season than the NFL off season. It's a year round thing. Um, so I've enjoyed that. And I really, throughout that entire process of making the jump, realizing, okay, this could be the move that helps set up the next big thing in my career. Um, it's really cool for me to look back at like kind of the nonlinear path I took to get there because I went, you know, by way of the South and by way of the West coast mm-hmm. just to get back to the Midwest. And, you know, so far, I mean, it's worked and, and I love it. I think you did, you know, you did a lot with a little resources, especially at the Clarence Legend. And I think that helped you at um, in the Bay Area. And then that in turn to that that uh, great 27th birthday you got. Yeah, <laughs> that man, awesome. that was the best gift I've ever gotten. <laughs> How does it feel to be on TV uh, from time to time? It's cool. I'm, you know, I obviously did it to some degree with all of our live streaming. And, you know, I did a lot of TV hits in, in Jackson. And, you know, we, we up the ante when, you know, we're out in California doing all of our warrior shows and things mm-hmm. like that but it's, it's a little different when you go from that to sports center nfl right. live and you know i've been really fortunate to have a team that's very newsworthy uh so i've been on tv quite a lot and i mm-hmm. really you know it's not the main part of my job but it's a very important part of my job and i think that's why i would like working at espn so much because it's multifaceted like i mm-hmm. do a ton of radio i do a ton of you know written stuff for espn.com but mm-hmm. the tv work is just as important to me as anything else. I mean, I do get to do so much of it in season. Um, and, you know, especially, you know, if you're on the, if you're on like the forefront of breaking news, I mean, it's huge right. and it's really, really helps hone your skills when you get to continue to do it more, more often. And I'll tell you how much the, the state adopted you as their own. Every time you're on TV, uh, I see different coaches, you know, screenshotting the, the TV <laughs> and, and saying, look at my girl court and look, you know, just seeing, throwing it up there. And, and I think the entire state would, would like to say, and I'm going to speak for everybody there at the time, but say thank you for the stuff you did for our kids, for the clearing ledger and for, you know, the exposure you gave the kids at the time because you literally busted your butt to to cover the entire state and not just make clarin ledger a metro newspaper your, your you. coverage was, was was statewide a um, couple, couple more questions before we get out would you have any advice to young journalists starting out I think the thing, I actually spoke with somebody about this recently. Um, what I try to do, and I mean, I'm 28. I don't have all the answers, but I have lived a lot of life in mm-hmm. terms of being the journalist uh, that I am today over the last six years, which means you got to hustle for what you want, which means you got to live places you might not necessarily be familiar with. You can't be afraid to move. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't be, and obviously financials play into that, you know, where you are in your life. Like, you know, if someone asked me right now to up and move somewhere else, I'd really, you know, that, that might be hard because it's like, I'm rooted here. I like me. I, you know, I'm contractually obliged to stay in Minneapolis (laughs) through my, through my contract and I want to, but like, you know, when you're young and you're not tied down by a contract, because most, most jobs like, you know, TV is one thing, but like newspapers by and large don't have contracts. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you can, I would say the thing I caution against, because I'm seeing this a lot with young journalists, like people who are making the jump right from college to, to covering it like a pro beat. I think everybody's got to cut their teeth with high school sports and recruiting. I mean, that's, not, that's something John Talty and I have like continually talked about through the years as we've stayed in touch mm-hmm. just about, um, you know, 
man, isn't it crazy? You see such and such already, they're covering this team and this team's an NFL team. And, you know, it's, it's like, where would we be without recruiting rewind? Where would we be without, <laughs> you know, me chasing, you know, John Perry off the field on Friday nights or, you know, going up and like getting like yelled at by Luther Riley for, you know, things like that. Like all that stuff that I did, like a- as a 22 year old kid, essentially mm-hmm. to where I'm at right now, six years later, I think you really got to take the opportunity. Like, you know, don't think any job is, is beneath you, especially when you're just starting out. Like that's why I hope we never lose the art of covering prep sports. To me, Mm -hmm. that is, um, you know, that that's important. That's, you know, that's, that's the basis of everything. Like you can't just start out covering the pros. You got to work up to something like that. And that's, that to me is probably the biggest piece of advice. Like hustle for what you want. Don't be afraid mm-hmm. to move. You got, and you're going to be moving often. Like, don't, don't settle. Like do, once you settle, you're done. Like, you know, you, you will be stuck in a place because you won't have the motivation to get out. And I think that's why, you know, you see people who really are on their grind. They're in a place every, you know, two to three years and then, the, then they bounce. So that's, mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of been my philosophy and it's not that I don't love the places that I've lived, but you know, there is something to it about trying to, you know, just always keep it moving and looking forward. Right. I think the Clarence Ledger has been through a lot of turnover. I don't know, oh, know yeah. if it's because the resources, the pay, or whatever it is, whatever it is. But you get a lot of guys. You know, I've I've lost touch with who covers the state. Even though I've moved, I, you know, I still try to keep up with it because of uh, you know because my relationship with Randall. But um, I don't even know who covers sports there now. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I know they've got a bunch. They've got a good group of young younger kids. I say kids, like they're probably like they're like <laughs> early twenties, like um probably like I was when we, when mm-hmm. I first got there, there was like a group of us that was, you know, early twenties, just trying to, trying to grind. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know if they, I feel like they've had to scale back in, uh, years past, just in terms of resources, in terms of how, what they're dedicating to high school football. And I know Gannett, you know, for, for it's kind of a shame. I know that they're with their deadlines on Friday nights, a lot of the games, you know, those game stories don't get in the paper and right. in a, in a rural state where Wi-Fi is still something that's not in every community, <laughs> like that's tough. Like people, yep. people don't realize that people who don't live in that, in that don't realize it at all that, you know, someone in Canton probably doesn't, you know, out like uh, off highway 52 or whatever it is like in the sticks, they don't got Wi-Fi. Right. They have, they, they have, they have, they get their clarion ledger every single day. Cause they go down to whatever count, uh, you know, nickel and dime store and pick it up there. I mean, exactly. that's, and that's the thing that we forget that you can't just as we're moving forward in the technological age, you can't just leave the rural world behind. And I think it's hard with newspapers and budgets and having to cut and things like that. And that's why you have probably seen a drop in high school coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just there at a time where they were willing to give me resources. I had to fight for a lot of those resources, but they were willing to turn it into what it is, what it was when I was there. Right. And um, with all this, you know, because the, the, the story itself seems like an, an all positive thing. And, and has there been any blowback with being a, a female in this in this business that you're in? You know, I think that you run into it. At every step, whether it's people underestimating your abilities, people not thinking that you know what you're talking about, people who want to speak for you or people who just, you know, don't want to hear a woman talk about sports. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's hard. There have been there have been moments, you know, throughout the last six years of my career where, you know, moments that have the potential to break you. But then you I think you really have to keep it in perspective and look big picture about mm-hmm. like where where, you know, if you let this break you, you're not going to get to where you're at right now. Like If I let every hurtful comment on every message board, um, or every, every comment that accused me of, you know, being a recruiter for Mississippi state or Ole Miss or that type of stuff, like try to like mess with my credibility. Like I wouldn't be anywhere. And, you know, I think it was a really cool experience for me to leave the state when I did, when the egg bowl rivalry was at its most toxic, which, you know, was (laughs) definitely, definitely perpetuated by certain quote, we'll, we'll, we'll loosely call them media, but the, uh, you know, the fan sites that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, had, had borderline ethical issues of how they covered recruiting and all of that. But like to watch it from like afar and watch it implode and smother itself, um, you realize that there are things bigger than that. And that to me was like, when you're in it, you think it's the biggest thing in the world. This is all people care about. Um, and then you go somewhere else and you realize it's a blip on the radar, but Mm -hmm. I'm glad I had both perspectives. That to me was very important, um, to know, you know, just, just why things are important to people, why people say the things they do and why people view, you know, sports and and the impact that they have the way that they do. 
Yeah. Now, again, I want to thank you for coming on here. I appreciate it. Your story is 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 one of inspiration. Is one of of um, uh, grinding. Is one of just you know seeing your goal and fighting through it and going through it. And like I said, you're one of the inspirations for me even starting this podcast and even starting thank the YouTube you. channel and doing the things that I do on, on top of coaching. And you know, this stuff that I do digital wise, I, I just I. I just love doing it. And it's, you know, based off you and some other people that just told me to go do it because I'm always talking about doing it. I just kept putting it off, kept putting it off. Some people told me to go do it. And I bought a mic and I went. So this is I hear been you. Going for about a year. Good but, for um, you. That's awesome. What What's the uh, social media information where people that, that don't know you or just going to be introduced to you uh, can, can, can listen and get in touch and, and things like that? Sure. I, I'm really active on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is Courtney R. Cronin. And then I think it's I have the same handle on Instagram as well, Courtney R. Cronin. So I'm on both of those pretty regularly. I'm, you know, if you, if you want to follow me, you're going to see a lot of Viking stuff. But I, I like to throw some other things up there, too. And, and those that don't know her um, 90s, early 2000s rap lyric <laughs> recall is it, pretty, uh, it's pretty dope. It's pretty dope because I think most of, not most, but some of our conversations through uh, Twitter have been because she quoted one of a song that I recalled or something. <laughs> it's and funny. It, it's, it, it goes, it goes deep, and she's she's a great follow on Twitter. And again, I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for coming on the Silver Tele Podcast. Uh, we're episode 22, if I'm not mistaken. And again, thank you, Courtney, and I appreciate it. And this is uh, Coach Evans, and we're out of here. Let me stop recording.